Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm Eugene Kaspersky, uh, co-founder and uh, CEO of the company, which is by coincidence has the same name. So today I'm going to talk about the cyberspace, about the, uh, the news, uh, the situation, what's going on there, and uh, the way how to make the cyberspace more safe and more secure. And uh, first of all, I'm going to talk about the sources of the cyber attacks. Who is behind all this uh, uh, mal all that malware, internet worms, uh, hackers attacks? Uh, in the past, when I just started in uh, '89, um, end of '80s, beginning of '90s, um, there were kids, teenagers, who were writing computer viruses just for fun. In the very beginning, there were even. I will, Call them researchers because uh, they were, it was like an innovation. They were inventing their life in the cyberspace, cyber life in the cyberspace. And uh, most of uh, computer malware, computer viruses, uh, they were written not to damage data, not to steal data, but just to uh, try new algorithms, how their uh, computer life can exist in a computer. Uh, computer systems. That was before internet. And uh, computer viruses, they were traveling by floppy disks. Uh, do you, do you? <laughs> yes? Okay, so the floppy disk is like, okay, they were this size, then this size, then this size, and then, hey, internet. Uh, so this uh, computer, computer virus is uh, very uh, simple, very primitive. They were written by kids, by teenagers, by students. Okay, no, no, not really. no, no, no. I'm absolutely sure you don't do that now. Uh, simply because uh, their uh, computer viruses now they are not written by students. Uh, students don't have time for that. Uh, students play computer games. If not. Well, when I was a student, that was a very, I remember, it was a very, very hard time because I had to split my life between education and girls. Uh, now it's even worse, education, girls and the internet. I don't know, I don't understand how do you survive in such a, such a situation. Uh, but I'm sure that now the students are not so involved in their uh, computer virus developing, uh, simply because you don't have time for that. You play computer games, I know. Uh, so who is behind uh, their attacks on the internet? Actually, there are several sources, and first, that's uh, cyber criminals. Uh, there were cyber attacks, which we can uh, define as criminal attacks even in early 90s, but that was not massive. Uh, the first criminal attacks of the new era, they, are fo they were following the new internet services. Uh, internet money and in online banking. Uh, you'll not believe that, but 10 years ago we didn't have, well, 12 years ago we didn't have online banking. Do you remember? That 2000, 2001, there were just first services were introduced for online banking. Before that, there were first internet money systems like e-gold, web money. So you locate some, you know, some amount of the real money somewhere and you can access them through internet services, but that wasn't real banking. So it was introduced in early 2000s. And cyber criminals, they followed that immediately. Uh, they developed the new types of malware, which was designed to steal this money from this uh, internet accounts and bank accounts. Uh, they were individuals, uh, uh, now they're professional gangs, international gangs uh, from Russia, sorry about that, from Latin America, from China. Uh, actually, the most of malware speaks, uh, most, of all, most of malware speaking Chinese. Uh, well, it doesn't well, it's not proof that uh, this uh, malware is made in China, maybe in Singapore, or maybe some other countries. Uh, the second most speaking uh, language in a uh, cyber crime world is uh, Spanish and Portuguese. Well, we can see the. In some cases, we don't see the difference between Spanish and Portuguese because the malware uh, coordinates with a. Uh, common services uh, with a very simple words, which same in Spanish and Portuguese. Uh, the third spoken language in the cyberspace is Russian. 
sorry, again. Uh, then others. So, cyber criminals, a lot of them. How many? Uh, once we made the research, how many sources of attack we see in the cyberspace. And uh, we counted that from 1500 to maybe 1300 sources and the gangs they have uh, some gangs have 10 people some have 20 once we had a, we had a report from brazil uh, there was a cyber gang arrested 80 people in the gang all arrested so maybe up to 100,000 people active cyber criminals uh, developing malware and attack the victims in the cyberspace in the internet and in mobile networks uh, next hacktivists Anonymous groups, which have a little bit different motivation, but I'm going to talk about motivation uh, later. Uh, so these uh, guys, uh, they think they are not criminals. Unfortunately, they are, because they violate the criminal code. So technically, they are criminals as well, but they are working for the idea, not for money. Uh, I like her. Making the internet revolution. Oh, I'm from the country which learned a lot from revolutions, so please don't do that. Uh, who is behind the most complicated attacks? I don't have any proof uh, because it's very difficult to attribute the source of the attacks. If they're criminals or activists, yes, it's possible. Uh, when it comes to the high profile attacks, a very complicated attacks, it's very, very difficult to prove who is behind that attack. Uh, but I'm pretty sure they are government agencies and well government sponsored attacks as well because uh, some of these attacks they are very complicated and it's not just a traditional criminal malware which is made by a couple of guys maybe by one individual and it's well i see it like a couple of days of software engineering or maybe one week and that's enough the criminal malware is done uh, but we see also espionage attacks they are very professional they are much more expensive to develop so there are big enough uh, budgets behind these attacks uh, maybe millions maybe 10 million uh, pounds to just just to de just to develop this software to upgrade it to distribute it and support uh, so that's very expensive attacks and definitely cyber criminals they don't have such a budgets to develop these attacks so i'm pretty sure there are government agencies and many countries already uh, confirmed that they have their military cyber divisions um, that's united states many countries in europe including the uk uh, china korea japan india well and terrorists at the moment i don't have any incidents which we can prove which is done by traditional terrorists we have no data about these attacks but i'm afraid it will happen um, some attacks they are very very close uh, to the term cyber terrorism I'm afraid we are almost there or even halfway there in a terrorist attacks against critical infrastructure. At the moment we are, there are just few incidents, I am going to talk about that later, uh, which are very close to cyber terrorism. So there are four sources of the attacks and there are different motivations for that. First of all, cyber crime, they, cyber crime is simple, they want money. That's it. They want your money. They do it. Uh, we made a research uh, with the help of our special software and we recognize that about 5% on computers in the global network are infected, at least 5%. So cyber criminals, they have a lot of opportunities to steal data from infected systems and they do it. And unfortunately, many of these guys, uh, cyber criminal guys, they are uh, quite wealthy. Uh, they have a good property, they drive expensive cars. Uh, they are arrested from time to time if, they, uh, if they're too visible, but unfortunately, they earn money. Uh, hacktivists, they have a political motivation. Uh, they want to damage reputation of the victims. Uh, 
maybe maybe it's very maybe it's the same people and it's very difficult to draw the line between criminals and hacktivists uh, i can imagine a person who is a hacktivist in the morning and he has a political motivation to damage some systems or to run the internet attacks at the end of the day he needs money and he runs the criminal attack could be who knows uh, military attacks uh, yes unfortunately I see that some of the attacks like uh, Stuxnet do you know the term Stuxnet attack on Iran nuclear facilities uh, that's kind of a military attack if we believe New York Times which has proved that uh, this attack was made by Israel and United States uh, with help of uh, German Siemens about the PLC devices in this case it was yes it was a military attack uh, recent attack on Korea did you see the news about attack on IT systems in Korea uh, there were 40 48,000 computers uh, erased damaged in uh, telecommunication companies in uh, news agencies if we believe that this Korean government is behind that attack, uh, North Korean government behind this attack, that's military action. And terrorism, sabotage, scare tactics, uh, damage, critical infrastructure, damaged networks, communications, uh, which is not government sponsored. Actually, there is a, the distance between military and sabotage is very short. If it's a government behind the attack, that's a military. If there are non-government, if there is an unknown organization behind the attack, that's terrorism. So actually, this. Uh, do you like this? The stories, which started with a computer, simple computer viruses, then some criminal attacks, then it came to the hell complexity criminal attacks and then it came to the terrorism uh, I hope that's the end of the story I hope this is the worst case scenario so cyber uh, computer malware came to terrorism that's it I'm pretty sure there is no more opportunity for cyber malware uh, to be named in the worst worst definitions okay so uh, Few examples of the malware which was designed for high profile espionage and uh, cyber sabotage. Uh, just some names to. I know you are not experts in IT security, but if you talk to IT security guy, these names is like a. Pfft, these are big names. So all that started back in the past uh, with uh, Stuxnet, that was the first malware attack which we can call as a, a cyber sabotage attack on Iran, on the nuclear facilities. Uh, then there was a flame, uh, sorry, Duku, flame and Gauss. There were espionage attack. And the last one, Red October, which was, well, massive espionage attack on uh, embassies and other high profile victims. And how many people were behind, for example, Red October? I think it's about 30, 50 people because there are a lot of manual work done there. So the people were collecting the data about, about victims, they were modifying the malware to attack victims again and again. So uh, there was a lot of manual work, 30, 50 people, and they were working for more than one year. Uh, I am pretty sure they had salaries. <laughs> and well, actually that's a software project. Uh, uh, the internet service which you don't really want and you don't pay for that <laughs> but you're a customer of the service uh, flame when we got flame we were really really scared because uh, we recognize it uh, that the flame is much more compli complicated than stuxnet so it means that even more complicated projects i it's possible to find in the internet uh, so that time I said that Stuxnet, I estimate it's, uh, the Stuxnet development as a $10 million uh, as a budget of this. I am software engineer, was, now I'm CEO of software company. We can estimate the budget behind the software project. So Stuxnet was as complicated as a $10 million software. 
so when they came so flame and we recognize it that there are several versions of flame I said maybe hundred million dollars behind the project uh, so that's pretty <laughs> I'm hundred percent sure that's uh, not cyber crime behind these attacks okay so uh, what's the difference between uh, these types of the attacks uh, which we can call them almost military attacks or cyber espionage and cyber sabotage attacks and uh, uh, the traditional weapons traditional espionage attacks and uh, I have this ABC of uh, uh, cyber weapons and uh, cyber tools and first of all in a cyberspace attribution is very 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 complicated uh, if we're talking about cyber crime it's possible to trace these guys because the cyber criminals uh, crime is a day-by-day -day business for them so almost every day they attack a new victim uh, every almost every day they release a new malware to the internet every day they collect some data from the internet so it's possible step by step to get more close to the bad guys surround them and prove that they are source of this criminal attack and actually the cyber police and uh, in the future Interpol uh, is going to do exactly the same it, it, it's possible to do in case of uh, military attack or high profile espionage attack it's very difficult to prove because they just send a missile that's it the missile was sent and forget about finding the source of the attack in the internet who did it? Somebody may be in Heathrow Airport having free Wi-Fi without internet passport, without identifying himself or herself. So in the cyberspace, attribution is very tricky. Uh, and the side effect of that, it's very possible to point a finger to the wrong source. If, uh, mm, say, Japan is victim of the Chinese-speaking malware, is it proof that it's military operation from China? Ask Japanese guys if they are victims of the serious attack. They will say China. Uh, <laughs> okay, if England is a victim of Scottish speaking <laughs> oh, talking about terrorists after the football match which uh, some football hooligans are not happy <laughs> okay so first a attribution is very 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 complicated uh, b when a cyber weapon is released it's possible to be a victim of the very similar malware it's a boomerang effect computer viruses they are viruses they can infect you in return uh, if we believe well maybe 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 that's true that Stuxnet was developed by United States and Israel uh, do you know how many victims were infected by Stuxnet on the territory of United States and Israel I don't know but many and last year Chevron it's a it's a huge oil and gas company in the United States. They confirmed that they were badly infected by Stuxnet. So the cyber weapon, when it's sent, it can get back as a boomerang. Uh, third, collateral damage. Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the cyber weapon, which is designed to damage some industrial environment, uh, if it has a mistake, Cyber weapon, it's a cyber weapon. It's a software. Software has bugs, you know, mistakes. And what about the attack, which is not able to recognize exact target? What about attack, I don't know, uh, on the power plant, which will hit similar power plants? Because the power plants, they're made on the different projects, but they're similar projects as well. So some power plants, they look similar, transportation system, etc, etc, etc. 
I'm afraid about collateral damage. There is a somewhere military conflict far, far, far away from you. Somewhere Argentina against UK. And Latin America is a random victim of the cyber attack sent by... Okay. I'm not talking about politics. Uh, D. Unfortunately, it's not possible to protect. Uh, unfortunately, the systems which manage the critical infrastructure, uh, the power, uh, telecommunication, transportation, uh, healthcare, they are built on a insecure operating systems like Microsoft Windows, Unix, Linux. They are insecure. Uh, Mac is non-secure as well, but uh, as far as I know, this uh, industrial system, they don't use Mac. There are not so many Mac engineers. That's why there are not so many Mac malware, because cyber criminals, they are humans too. They don't know how to develop software for Mac. So unfortunately, the systems which are managing their, our world, it's, they are everywhere. They are designed on the top of non-secure operating systems. Applications are non-secure as well. Unfortunately, as Stuxnet, Stuxnet is a proof of that, it's possible to infect even systems which are disconnected from the internet and to damage them. And, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about protection, but at the moment, right now, there is no protection against such attacks. And Last, uh, I don't want to say that it's easy to develop cyber weapon, but it's software. It's much easier than traditional uh, traditional military tools. Uh, Stuxnet, Gauss, Flame, other systems to develop such attack is much more, much ch cheaper much less expensive than to develop cruise missile or nuclear submarine or military jet. Much more easy because they're just engineers which need time, information, computers, access to the internet. Well, it's expensive. It's expensive but much less expensive than traditional weapons. So A, B, C, D, E. Unfortunately, I'm afraid many countries around the world and even non-government organizations and maybe terrorists, they're able to learn, they're able to copy, they're able to create, or if they don't have engineers, they can employ engineers from other countries. And software is software. You can build a system which only part of that is a warhead. The rest doesn't look like a weapon. So the engineers, they will even don't know, don't, don't understand that they are developing cyber weapon. And only one person or maybe some people will know that they are assembling the internet, the cyber missile from these components. Uh, so that's why uh, when I'm talking about cyber weapons, uh, all the time say it's a, maybe it's a one of the most dangerous innovations of this century. Okay, what's next? Critical targets, three different uh, scenarios. That's a worst case scenarios. Uh, I'm a security guy and I'm working with IT security for almost 25 years. Uh, of course, I became paranoid. And as many security guys, I have two halves of the, my, in my brain, uh, left and right. I don't know which is which when I'm thinking about uh, security, but one half of my mind is thinking about attacks designing the worst case scenarios and uh, another half is thinking about protection uh, as many security people do so they are thinking both ways how to attack and how to protect so to my mind there are three worst case scenarios first of all it's attack on industrial systems like a stuxnet uh, and like actually the internet worms in 2003 did do you remember Internet, well, sorry, do you remember blackout in uh, New York in 2003? Do you? Do you know the reason of this blackout? No. Well, I have time for one more story. 
So, in 2003, in August, there was an epidemic of uh, blaster worm. Uh, the worm which has infected millions of the computers everywhere in the globe within a very short period of time, some, some hours. And there was a huge epidemic in the internet. Same time when the worm came to his top, to the peaks of the infection, there was a blackout in New York, in Toronto, in other East Coast cities. That was in August 2003. And same day, I had a call from a Russian journalist, and he asked me, hey, Eugene, what do you think about that? Maybe there is some connection between the virus epidemic and a blackout in the United States and New York. I said, no possible. Uh, because I'm sure that the internet, uh, the computer systems which manage the power grid in the United States, they are not connected to the internet. Ho, ho. <laughs> I was a little boy. Next day I learned that, well, <laughs> they are connected. Okay. The next day was another report that uh, the main reason of uh, this blackout, it was a tree. Uh, falling on the electric line. I said, oh, hey, United States is a great country. Even trees are connected to the internet in the United States. Uh, there, there were some news about a squirrel which got to the wrong box in there, this power plant. I said, okay, but that was a cascade attack. So it was a squirrel cascade attack on it. Well, the reality is, uh, so, the worm which infected millions of the computers, it was designed to infect Microsoft Windows operating system. And there was a vulnerability, there was an exploit. And actually, the, the, the Microsoft already released the patch, but that time not many people or organizations patched the systems. So, the worm used vulnerability to attack uh, inter-process communication library. Just remember that. But this code, this mistake, it wasn't made by Bill Gates. That was a Unix library, which was used in Unix, Linux, and Microsoft Windows. And Unix already had a patch for that, but not many organizations patched. So there were exploit, which killed Unix systems. The exploit which infected Windows and killed Unix, but it didn't kill all the system. It killed only this inter applications communication library. So the Unix system, they looked alive. So engineers, they were able to stop applications, start application, type on the keyboard. They looked alive, but applications inside, they were not able to talk to each other. So engineers lost the time. They had the calls from outside. Hey guys, I have a problem. They, no, we don't. Or like this. So they lost time. They didn't understand that there's a serious problem in their system. And the end, the result, blackout. So in 2003, that was the first incident, which we can call as a cyber terrorism. Uh, Either individual or some organization turns off the light in a city like New York, is it terrorism? Si, sí, senores. So, the next one uh, was military attack on their uh, industrial system, the nuclear system in uh, Iran. Okay, so first, attack on industrial system. Second, attack on the critical IT infrastructure. It's not on the mechanical stuff, it's just IT systems. But IT systems, they are extremely important in many operations. Attack on Saudi Aramco, the, uh, the main oil contractor to United States, in August last year. 30,000 computers were wiped. And it wasn't a big damage on the hardware. It wasn't a damage on the oil production, on the tubes, but the company was paralyzed for two weeks. Uh, January this year, I had a, on a forum on the panel, oh, sorry, that was a meeting with uh, gas and oil companies, and there was uh, the president and CEO of Aramco was there, and uh, he said that 
he commented this uh, incident, he said, we don't understand how much we depend on IT until the catastrophe. And the catastrophe is like a body with no oxygen in the blood. So the company was virtually paralyzed for two weeks. The oil production was in place. They did it. The ships were coming. Uh, the barrels were not counted. They didn't know where to send it. They didn't know where to, to, to what to do with that. The company was paralyzed. It was like a body with no oxygen in the blood. Uh, recently there was attack on Korean uh, companies as well. I still don't have uh, enough of data of details to talk about that, but that was very bad as well. And the third type of attack, attacks on the telecommunications. The uh, US attack on Estonia in 2007, then the whole the country was disconnected from the internet. And actually it wasn't just your favorite uh, social network is offline. No, uh, they also affected, for example, financial system and many, many other systems which they use internet to communicate to the external services, to the abroad services. Uh, but it's not only uh, attacks on the internet. I'm expecting to see attacks on the mobile networks. We didn't have it yet, but I'm afraid it will happen. Uh, there also, it's possible to attack uh, the dedicated networks, uh, industrial networks like uh, some financial networks or enterprise networks and some multinational organizations. So there are three worst case scenarios, attack on the SCADA, on industrial systems, critical IT infrastructure and telecommunications. Uh, so how, would, how typically it happens? First of all, uh, there is a victim and there is an attacker. So first of all, attacker collects some data about the victim. They want to learn more. They want to understand the ways of the successful attack. Using the exploits in their victim site and using social engineering how to get the malware to there. Uh, they analyze the data. They design the attack. Uh, they develop their missile the cyber missile, they send it, then infect the system, they collect the data and they analyze it. And in the loop. Uh, in this way, uh, Stuxnet worked. In this way, Red October was working for years. In this, this way, many other high profile attacks and military attacks are designed. Uh, so I'm about to talk about protection. Yes, now protection. So, what to do? How to protect the systems? Uh, well, actually, if we're talking about industrial systems and in IT, uh, critical IT infrastructure, there are ways how to do that. Uh, to protect uh, these two elements, uh, the first of all, there have to be very strict policies. Unfortunately, many organizations, they are still very open to the internet and uh, this is the very easy way for the bad guys have to get in, have to infect the system. I'm afraid that in the critical organizations, internet must be switched off. I'm afraid if it's not possible, there has to be very, very strict regulation on the connections. I understand that in many organizations, employees will be not happy with that, but there is only one way, very strict regulation. Second, users education. Uh, what really helps if there are some classes about social engineering, and actually it's a very, very funny education classes, because there's a stories about successful hacks. How can be done within a very simple way? How to make people to click on the on, on attached file? How to make people to take the USB from the parking slot and bring it to the corporate environment? It's very, very, very funny education classes, and we're going to share that with you as well. Uh, second, technologies. Actually, there are technologies how to make uh, the IT systems and SCADA system, industrial system, more safe and more secure. Uh, first of all, a uh, very simple way how to make the SCADA industrial environment more safe. Uh, of course, it's better that if it's 
this this environment is disconnected and then if you use Microsoft Windows to manage SCADA and there is Microsoft Windows to develop SCADA software it's a very bad idea to bring the software directly to their industrial environment put a Linux system in between and copy the data through Linux it will stop most of the malware it will stop Stuxnet so it will fix the problem of collateral damage but it will not fix the problem of the targeted attack if they want to hack you they will develop the worm which will infect both Windows and Linux how to protect from this scenario to design uh, the system which we call default deny the system which is runs only trusted applications so all other applications they are forbidden only applications which are installed in the system and which are installed by trusted updater only in this way uh, and of course there is a very high demand on the international cooperation uh, because these types of the attacks they will of course cross borders and it's not only about cooperation within Europe and United States I well, I'm sure that there have to be such countries as Russia, China, Latin American countries. They have to join this cooperation against cyber weapons and against cyber espionage. And then, what's the best way have to protect the computer systems? Secure operating system. Uh, we have this uh, uh, idea of the system and we have uh, this uh, research and development. Uh, it's based on the macro kernel architecture and uh, uh, we sign not only uh, applications we sign the behavior of applications it means that if application is calculator calculator it doesn't have access to the internet that's it if you're a printer you have access to printer not to USBs it's like this so it's like I call it prison for applications so it guarantees that first of all there are no vulnerabilities because of the macro kernel architecture and second it's a prison for applications because only trusted applications with only trusted behavior are allowed to be executed okay going on so uh, evolution of cyberspace and cyber threats 20 years ago, 25 years ago, there were just script kiddies, they are young guys. Well, some of these young guys, they were 36, uh, like uh, Melissa, author, do you remember? Melissa Worm, which infected so many computers. So he was 36, uh, but I, from his interview, I recognized, but he was 36, but still 14 in mind. Like we call that this guy's 14 forever. Very lucky man. Uh, but well, uh, years ago there were just script kiddies and uh, very primitive uh, computer worm, computer viruses, which were traveling from application to application, from the floppy disk to computer to the floppy disk. And that time we had we need just antivirus product to protect from these uh, quite primitive attacks. Then next. Uh, internet internet worms uh, hackers attacks criminals so the level of attacks the complexity of attacks jumped up and there was a need of the internet security suites of uh, extra levels of protection and not only at end point but also at gateways and at ISPs internet providers now we are facing the attacks on the critical infrastructure uh, criminals are still there plus to that very complicated and high profile espionage attacks and cyber sabotage military attacks so now there is a very high demand on a extra solution the solutions of the this uh, this era the era of cyber weapons and cyber wars so First of all, we need and we have and we use technologies how to detect massive criminal attacks. 
we need the technologies, we have some ideas and we have some technology, but still the solution is not ready how to protect from the targeted attack, the high profile, high complexity espionage attacks. And we need to protect this world from any types of the attacks, including cyber weapons, uh, cyber, including cyber sabotage attacks on the IT infrastructure, on the critical industrial systems and telecommunications. Uh, actually, the, the job of IT security is getting more and more complicated. That's the bad news. The good news, IT security engineers, they are paid better and better and better. And the bad news personally to me, I pay. <laughs> So, at the end of my presentation, I uh, simply want to share my view on the IT security. I think it will be the very hot place for next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, there is not enough of IT security experts. Uh, the government organizations and private companies, they are hunting for IT security heads. Uh, there are hundreds of jobs are created every year in the United States and in Europe. Uh, so if you are in the IT security stream, you have a safe future. Thank you so much. And uh, if you want to find me, if you want to reach me, just uh, get to the uh, eugene.kaspersky.com. It's my blog and you may ask the questions there. Okay, thank you.